Today I'm going to talk to you about a very special wood that I'm working with right now. There is a guitar in the background and it is made from this wood. And since I joined this industry, whenever it was, I've had a bit of a bee in my bonnet about it. So let's just get that over with. And I'll only say it once. Don't make me say it again. A lot of people call this wood bog oak. I mean, come on guys, you don't need a first class degree in marketing to work out that that is not what you should be calling this amazing wood. It's like calling this Caravaggio an ode to constipation. There is so much more to it than its surface objectivity. I would like to speak to the manager. Anyway, let's move past that because we do have an, a range of names that are way more acceptable. We've got Royal Fenland Oak. We've got Fossilized Oak. We've got Neolithic Black Oak. You can take your pick. That's all I'll say on the matter. So now we can get into this incredible material and how it's really made a name for itself as a fantastic tone wood in guitar making and also just a beautiful wood to be used in furniture like tables i think there's a famous table currently in ely cathedral which is near where the uh, wood gets its heritage that is quite celebrated at the moment and to tell the story we need to imagine imagine with me there you go shut your eyes cool uh, imagine with me that you are in neolithic england yes i can hear it now at that time in history, the East Anglian Fenland Basin was covered in beautiful big oak trees. Now, oak trees typically thrive at lower elevation areas such as East Anglia, so although you do see oak trees all around the UK because they are highly adaptable, this was a particularly forested oak area. Not only was it perfect because of its elevation, but also this area had a really fantastic soil, which any farmer from Norfolk will tell you. And this particular soil in the region was peat soil. Anyway, I'm gonna come back to that. So these trees are having a wicked time. There's no humans to uh, cut them down and be awful. Yay! They are living the dream, no worries at all. However, as they are often wont to do, the sea levels at this time started to rise. Don't ask me why I'm not a geologist. I am not even a historian, so sorry, I'm a woodworker. But rose they did, and subsequently the Fenland area was flooded from the sea because it's basically just, as I say, a basin. Uh, so it's essentially a giant puddle just completely swamped these poor oak trees, <laughs> leaving them to die as they stood. So as these trees fell, they were, as I say, they went in one by one. They fell on top of each other, much like a, a Jenga or matchstick situation. The ones that fell first were the ones that were obviously deepest in the soil. Now the ones at the top were very quickly eaten up by fungi and decomposition in general, because they did have an oxygenated environment and they were able to be broken down by all of the nasty or oh, nice fungi in the river or whatever it is, the sea, the basin, the puddle, whatever you want to call it. But the ones that were pushed down, that's a different story. Now peat bogs are anaerobic, so that means that they uh, have little to no oxygen in them. And that also means that the preservation potential in these environments is just fantastic. Nowhere like it. You want to hide a body? Throw it in a peat bog. Oh, I'm so sorry. Don't do that. Basically what the pH in the peat is doing is um, creating a sort of vinegary substance, like a vinegary pH level. So it's basically like pickling the tree. And what that looks like is something that we might all be more familiar with, which is early stages of um, fossilization, which is really cool. I think you know where I'm going with this, but what happened was these trees didn't go anywhere because they didn't decompose. So the ones right at the bottom, eventually when agriculture started happening uh, to a more sophisticated machine-y level, farmers would come along with their tractors and their plows and whatever and they would suddenly hit this massive object and they'd be like, what the hell was that? And it was fossilized oak. Can you imagine just driving your tractor, having a great time, and then you find a fossilized oak tree from 5,000 years ago. <laughs> I think I'd have a mental breakdown. Anyway, so that's what this is behind me. It's had three out of four sides bound and the, la the last remaining side is on the back. So just ignore the fact that there's not binding on it. But this is it. It's a bit grubby as well because I've had, <laughs> had glue on it, but um, moon spruce top not oak top, marbled paper from the 18th century rosette, and uh, yeah, fossilized Neolithic Fenland oak on the back and sides. Now there are a couple of things that I'm gonna address in regard to this wood, now you know the story behind it, but the first thing I'm gonna address is the color of it, because you see, this is not <laughs> what oak looks like normally. Absolutely gorgeously black, this is why the client, my client wanted to go with such a, a beautifully white top, this is um, Swiss moon spruce. It's just, the contrast is lovely. It's, it's a really great wood for achieving that kind of contrast without using something really heavy like ebony. Let me show you some regular oak actually so you can see because I do have some here. 
this is actually some particularly spicy oak, so um, ignore the amazing figure, but the colour is very much more like this. It's like a really beautiful uh, light colour. There's a time obviously for that beautiful colour, but there's also a time for this amazingly contrasting, stunning black oak as well. Now the reason for this beautiful transformation happening is because there is uh, iron in the soil that reacts with the tannins in the wood and turns it black. That's as much as I understand to be the process, there is obviously a lot more that you can look into around that process, but uh, that is essentially it. So please do go and do research and drop me a comment if you find kind of more about that process because it's interesting. Uh, the other thing that the other thing that I want to address is the fact that um, you're probably wondering, uh, Daisy, very nice for a guitar, but isn't it soaking wet if it's been in a for however long? And the answer is uh, yes, it was, but then the drying process is incredibly complex. I'm not equipped to deal with that myself. My supplier does it. Hamish at Adamson and Lowe, who are the people who specialize in bog oak, he wrote a fantastic article where I've actually got a lot of my knowledge today because I read it back in the day when I first got my hands on some of this wood. And um, when it came to the drying process, Hamish says this, I'm gonna quote him here. It is usual at the end of the drying process to have removed from the timber a staggering 3.2 gallons of water per cubic foot which is over 50% of the tree's original volume and each plank reduces its width and thickness by one third so that's pretty mental stuff so that's the answer to that I mean it is worth it thank you Hamish for doing that and that brings me on to the tone of it so I anticipate I mean I've I've worked on Neolithic oak instruments before and they've all sounded really lovely but again I think that's to do with the the luthia uh, Rosie, my second mentor, she specialised a lot in English British woods and again if you want a British wood guitar I would 100% go to Rosie, she is the queen. She worked with this a lot and her guitars just always seem to sound divine so you know I don't think that it is going to hold anyone back tonally. It is also worth mentioning that a lot of hardwoods which are very desirable for guitar making, exotic hardwoods like Indian rosewood or just any rosewood, like slightly denser and heavier wood uh, this is very, very similar. When I'm when I was tap testing it at the beginning, before I was, or when I was thicknessing it, it was very much behaving like a rosewood. It's been a real joy so far, and I, I can't actually wait to see what I can do with it. I've voiced it now, I've voiced the instrument, and I'm I'm really happy with how it's ringing when I strike it properly. And I think it's going to be really nice. It's going to have a sycamore neck with it, which I'm making somewhere over there, which again is just going to really add to the contrast of the instrument. So I'm, I'm just really excited about it. And I hope you guys have enjoyed learning about this wood because um, I think it's beautiful and I get really sad that it's called <laughs> what it's called in many a circle. And you know what? Hashtag fossils deserve better. There's a sentence I didn't think I'd say at work.